they told us it was dead. A frozen ball of ice and rock, drifting through the darkness at the edge of everything we know. For nearly a decade, Pluto was the forgotten world, the planet that wasn't. Stripped of its title, erased from textbooks, dismissed by the scientific establishment as insignificant. But on July 14, 2015, after traveling 3 billion miles through the void, NASA's New Horizons probe sent back images that would shatter everything we thought we knew. What it found wasn't a graveyard. It was a living world. A planet with glaciers that flow, mountains made of water ice taller than the Rockies, and snow that falls in shades of red. A world that defies the laws we wrote that challenges our understanding of what's possible in the frozen depths of space. This is the story of how we underestimated Pluto and why this small, distant world might be one of the most extraordinary places in our entire solar system. Let's go back to 2006. For 76 years, Pluto had been our ninth planet. Discovered by Clyde Tombaugh, in 1930 it was the underdog of the solar system. Small, distant, mysterious. But it was ours. Then came the meeting in Prague. The International Astronomical Union gathered to answer a question that had been brewing for years. What exactly is a planet? The problem? Astronomers were discovering dozens of Pluto-sized objects beyond Neptune. If Pluto was a planet, then so were they. Our solar system could have dozens, maybe hundreds of planets. So they made a decision. They drew a line. To be a planet, a celestial body had to clear its orbital path of debris. Pluto hadn't done that. It shared the Kuiper belt with thousands of other icy bodies. With a single vote, Pluto was reclassified. Not a planet, a dwarf planet. The world reacted with outrage. Petitions were signed. Textbooks were rewritten. Children mourned. But the scientific community was resolute. Pluto was just another Kuiper Belt object. Cold, inert, unremarkable. Case closed. Or so they thought. January 19, 2006. Just months before Pluto's demotion, a spacecraft the size of a grand piano launched from Cape Canaveral. Its name was New Horizons. Its mission, a nine-year journey to the edge of the solar system, to finally see Pluto up close. Think about that for a moment. Nine years. Traveling at 36,000 miles per hour, the fastest spacecraft ever built. And still, it would take nearly a decade to reach this distant world. When New Horizons launched, we had never seen Pluto in detail. Our best images from the Hubble Space Telescope showed nothing but a blurry, pixelated blob. We knew it had a moon called Charon. We knew it had a thin atmosphere. But beyond that, we were flying blind. The scientists prepared for the worst. They expected a dead world, cratered and ancient, frozen in time since the birth of the solar system. No atmosphere to speak of. No geological activity. Just ice and rock, preserved in the deep freeze of space. The probe would get one shot, one flyby. Just 14 minutes of closest approach. After nine years of travel, there would be no second chances. As New Horizons hurtled through the darkness, covering a million miles every three weeks, humanity waited. What would we find at the end of the solar system? July 14, 2015. The first high-resolution images began arriving at Mission Control, and what appeared on those screens stopped everyone cold. This wasn't the world they expected. Pluto's surface was smooth. Incredibly smooth. Vast plains of nitrogen ice stretched for hundreds of miles, completely devoid of impact craters. You know what that means? Those plains were young. Geologically speaking, they formed yesterday, maybe within the last few million years. But that should be impossible. Pluto is 3.6 billion miles from the Sun. It receives 1,600 times less sunlight than Earth. 
its surface temperature is 380 degrees Fahrenheit. At that distance, that size, that temperature, Pluto should have frozen solid billions of years ago. Whatever heat existed in its interior should have long since radiated away into space. And yet, here it was, active, alive. The images kept coming, mountains of water ice towering three miles high. But not just any mountains. These peaks were shaped differently, almost dome-like. They looked volcanic. Then came the most stunning revelation. Pluto might have cryovolcanoes. Ice volcanoes. Instead of spewing molten rock, they could be erupting with frozen nitrogen, water ice, and ammonia. Reshaping the surface, renewing it. The team discovered glaciers made of nitrogen ice, flowing like rivers through Pluto's valleys. They found a giant heart-shaped region, Tombaugh Regio, covered in these exotic ices. The glaciers were actually flowing, convecting, turning over like boiling water in extreme slow motion. And the colors. Nobody expected the colors. Pluto's surface was painted in reds, oranges, and browns. This wasn't ordinary ice. These were complex organic molecules called tholins, created when sunlight and cosmic rays strike methane in Pluto's thin atmosphere. They fall as snow, red snow, coating mountains, filling craters, painting this distant world in shades we associate with life. But the strangeness didn't end with Pluto itself. There's Charon, Pluto's largest moon. Except calling it a moon doesn't quite capture the relationship. Charon is so large, roughly half Pluto's diameter, that the two worlds orbit a common point in space between them. They're locked in a gravitational dance, each forever showing the same face to the other. A binary system? A double planet. And Charon? It's just as bizarre. It has a massive canyon system that dwarfs the Grand Canyon. Cracks in the surface that suggest its interior once froze and expanded. And at its north pole, a reddish stain. Scientists call it mortar macula. It might be tholins captured from Pluto's atmosphere, stolen by Charon during their eternal waltz. Then there's Pluto's atmosphere. It was supposed to be barely there, a whisper of nitrogen and methane. Instead, new horizons found layers. Structure, haze, extending 100 miles above the surface. The atmosphere was escaping into space at hundreds of tons per hour, creating a tail like a comet. And here's the thing that keeps scientists awake at night. Where is the energy coming from? Pluto should be dead. The internal heat that drives geological activity should have vanished eons ago. The tidal forces from Quran aren't strong enough. Solar heating is negligible. And yet, something is powering these ice volcanoes, driving these glaciers, maintaining this thin envelope of atmosphere. Some scientists propose radioactive decay in Pluto's core. Others suggest a subsurface ocean, insulated beneath miles of ice. Some theorize about exotic chemistry we don't yet understand. The truth is, we don't know. And that's what makes Pluto so extraordinary. Pluto's revelations changed everything about how we see the outer solar system. Because Pluto isn't alone. Beyond Neptune lies the Kuiper Belt, a vast ring of icy bodies extending billions of miles into space. There are hundreds of thousands of objects out there, maybe millions, worlds we've barely glimpsed. If Pluto, small, distant, supposedly inert, can be this active, what about the others? We've already found hints. Eris, larger than Pluto, make-make with its own atmosphere. Haumea, spinning so fast it's shaped like a football. Sedna, on an orbit so elliptical it might take 11,000 years to go around the sun once. These aren't just rocks, they're time capsules preserved from the earliest days of our solar system. They hold clues to how planets form, how organic chemistry develops, how the ingredients for life spread through space, and they're not dead. 
The Kuiper Belt might be one of the most geologically active regions we know. Cryovolcanism, subsurface oceans, organic chemistry, all happening in the deep freeze, powered by mechanisms we're only beginning to understand. Pluto taught us that the universe doesn't play by our rules. That dead is a premature diagnosis. That distance from the sun doesn't determine vitality. Some of the most extraordinary places in our solar system aren't the obvious ones. They're not Mars or Europa or Titan. They're these small, stubborn worlds at the edge of everything, refusing to be simple. New Horizons didn't stop at Pluto. It couldn't. Momentum carried it deeper into the Kuiper Belt toward a small object called Arakoth. On January 1st, 2019, it flew past this pristine snowman-shaped world, giving us our first glimpse of an undisturbed building block of planets. The probe continues outward. Right now, it's more than 5 billion miles from Earth, still sending back data, still functioning against all odds. Eventually, decades from now, it will fall silent, but its message will endure. Back on Earth, Pluto's redemption was already underway. Scientists began calling for a new definition of planet, one based not on orbital dynamics, but on the world itself. If a body is massive enough for gravity to pull it into a sphere, if it has geological processes, if it has an atmosphere and moons, then maybe, just maybe, it deserves the title. By that definition, Pluto is a planet. So is Charon. So are dozens of Kuiper Belt objects. So are large moons like Europa and Titan. The debate continues, but the science is clear. Pluto is not what we thought. In 2006, we stripped Pluto of its status because we underestimated it. We assumed that size mattered more than complexity. That distance meant death. That the edge of our solar system was the end of the story. Pluto proved us wrong. It showed us that worlds we dismiss might be the ones that surprise us most. That the universe is stranger, more diverse, more wonderful than our categories can contain. And somewhere out there, three billion miles away, nitrogen glaciers are still flowing. Red snow is still falling. Ice mountains are still rising from ancient plains. On a world we tried to forget. A world that refused to be forgotten. This is Pluto. Not a planet. Not a dwarf planet. A revelation 